um, we'll um, get started. And uh, the point is, uh, I probably have put up a list of topics that I wanted to do. Uh, but that, that's, there is no hard and fast rule. We go uh, just as far as uh, we want to, which is essentially, I mean, um, uh, I will be doing it all on the board. Uh, that is, and work out vast majority of the steps uh, of what I want to cover. Um, but uh, the point would be that uh, whatever uh, is, uh, there would be issues which would be somewhat um, uh, dubious, and so uh, you are free to stop at any time and ask. And so uh, we, as I said, at the end of the day, we cover only that which can be understood. So um, uh, let's get, uh, j just as a matter of curiosity, uh, how many of you have uh, sort of seen the Navier-Stokes equation written down? Oh, a huge number. So uh, almost all. So um, uh, we can sort of, you did see it written down a uh, few minutes ago, uh, except that uh, the nonlinear term was for most of the part hidden, hidden in that uh, capital uh, DDT. Uh, so, but we'll just spell it out a little more explicitly. So, nothing much to worry about. The point would be, what is it that we, the lectures are supposed to be on turbulence? And what is it that we are talking about? We are talking about a solution of, uh, given a particular situation, a solution of Navier-Stokes equation, that is what you have to solve. Velocities satisfy Navier-Stokes equation, and how the velocity field develops in time is the issue. So as a function of space and time, it's a partial differential equation, and uh, the, we will be talking about uh, that particular situation in which the velocity field, velocity vector as a function of time uh, seems like a random function, not something which uh, you can uh, sort of much too complicated, not sort of which you can write down in terms of known functions or things like that. So what, for those of you, uh, th this used to be much more of a mystery um, um, and, uh, uh, and a few decades ago, but at least, I mean, the uh, study of uh, dynamical systems, which is a set of coupled nonlinear ordinary differential equations, have shown uh, that if you are talking about uh, at least a three dimensional system, which is uh, function which is uh, an, a set of ordinary differential equations involving three variables, writing it out explicitly for you to begin with. So uh, if, you have, if you have two of them, two, two variables and two equations, nothing much happens except periodic orbits or orbits go off to infinity. Going off to infinity is not interesting at all. So one is interested only in bounded results. And if I have three at least, a big uh, example of that is the Lorentz model, which formed a paradigm for many years. Um, and so there you see a particular kind of behavior which came to be classified as chaotic. Chaotic behavior of the solutions. Now, what did this uh, chaotic behavior mean? O obviously, I mean, these are 
ordinary differential equations, I give you a set of initial conditions, x1, 0, x2, 0, x3, 0, and they are going to evolve in time. So they are going to evolve in time according to the solution of, um, uh, you put them on a machine, let's say, and you get uh, crank out uh, x1 as a function of time, x2 as a function. Uh, there is no difficulty with that. The, and also, if you give this exactly as the initial condition next time around, you will have the uh, solution come out exactly as it happened the previous time. The big thing about this chaotic, uh, chaotic behavior was extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. That was the bad thing. So that was the bad thing, which meant that if I just change this to x10 plus epsilon1, and maybe change the others, but this is sufficient change. Change it to change the initial condition slightly. The error as time in the evolution time increased. So if your evolution time increased, the distance between x the uh, now and the x well, let's say x1 prime this uh, xi prime this set and the xi the previous set the difference between these were not of order epsilon but became of order unity so that Differ so difference characterized, let's say, by the Euclidean distance between uh, the two sets of solutions. That became of order unity uh, as time increased, and, and instead of remaining in the vicinity of the small epsilon that came about. Now, this is what is dangerous. Why is this dangerous? Because in any practical situation, uh, you will be specifying the initial condition. Uh, this as a result, as a result of some uh, known data. So let's say uh, you were to study atmospheric dynamics. You need to study velocity, pressure, and what have you as a function of time. But I mean. Study what? It's evolution. I need the initial data. And initial data has a certain amount of error in it. There is a certain bit of accuracy that is involved. Now, the point is that, look, you may give what you think is uh, accurate data, that <clears throat> what you specify a data according to what you have got, and which is, so you give this, which is slightly the true, whatever the true thing is, let's say x1, this true x1, 0, x2, 0, x3, 0, this is the true set. You don't know the true set. You have made, you have, this is the result of the, known da this data, which has some error in it, maybe have a, give, uh, improve the accuracy of your uh, measurement process. You probably have a very good representation of what is true, but still you may be slightly off. And now if you are dealing with a system like this, the system of course does not, I mean for the system, this is what is true because that's what you have given it. And instead of evolving this, which it would have gone somewhere, the system fed by you evolves this, which has gone very far from it. So this is the problem, that 
this is what leads one, led one to say this is this extreme sensitivity to initial condition. And as you can see, things have gone haywire. You uh, thought that you have given the right initial uh, condition, but the initial, and so you expected a nice answer, but the initial conditions were a little off from the true value, and your expert, what you have calculated is very far from what is really going to happen. So the, now one of the difficulties with uh, weather prediction. Um, uh, so uh, the long-term uh, weather prediction. <clears throat> so uh, you see, this is what, uh, that is why the extreme sensitivity to the, came the notion of unpredictability. Un predictability because that sort of, I mean, it is not unpredictable in the sense that you put in exactly the same initial condition, do it now, do it later, you'll get the same answer. But it is this extreme sensitivity to initial condition which is behind this notion of unpredictability and therefore a question of talking about more about uh, probability of getting a particular answer rather than focusing on the actual answer. So this question of what is meant by a random function, so this is, what, this is what happens for the ordinary differential equations. Now, just three coupled ordinary differential equations does uh, the job for you. In Navier-Stokes equation, which is the uh, uh, evolution for the velocity field, you have a partial differential equation, nonlinear, which is an infinite set of ordinary nonlinear differential equations which are coupled. And therefore, uh, it is no wonder that you have a solution which looks very complicated, and we're talking about uh, the uh, exact solution becomes sort of fruitless, and it is better to talk about what is the probability of obtaining a particular v uh, velocity at a given position at a given time. So this is the whole business of turbulence, that this is, you are getting a solution of Navier-Stokes equation, which is not looking like a sort of repeatable answer. It is very sensitive to what kind of the initial conditions that you put in, and therefore it is uh, sort of unpredictable, and it would be much more useful to instead of talking about uh, 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 because you really don't want to uh, pin down your initial conditions too much. It is much better to take the uh, point of view that what is being generated for you is a random function, and one has to talk about uh, probability of this rather than the thing itself. So this is what one is uh, 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 concerned with, that this is why the issue of probability distribution moments and average values will come along uh, repeatedly. That is what the game is all about, talking about average values, deviations from average values, squares of uh, uh, deviation squares, and uh, various other moments and things like that. So that what, what turbulence naturally therefore involves is a question of studying the distrib underlying distribution of the solution of Navier-Stokes equation in some regime where, it, where the turbulence is a dominant behavior of the solution. So the first thing that one has to worry about is therefore that writing, we need to write down Navier-Stokes equation and decide where, in, under what situations would I see this turbulent behavior. So I'm going to write down Navier-Stokes equation, dv, uh, del v del t plus v dot grad acting on v. This is, this whole business is what uh, Professor Sukhatme a uh, few minutes ago wrote down as DDT of v. This is equal to 
minus grad P plus nu del square V plus some external force that there may be. Now, where, when, where is the density and what is a nu? Well, density, is, all this is incompressible. We are going to talk about, throughout these lectures, about incompressible fluids. In fact, even when we'll talk about buoyancy-driven fluids, even those would be taken to be incompressible by some nice trick. So incompressible fluids are going to be, uh, so incompressible fluids means that the density is constant, constant independent of time and space, and if it is constant, why not set it one? Or consider this P that I have written down over here as the pressure per unit density, if you so wish, and this new over here is your shear viscosity divided by rho. So nu is the kinematic viscosity and has the coefficients, has nu, uh, has the dimensions of uh, diffusion constant. So nu has the dimensions of uh, diffusion constant. As you can see, that's, uh, if I didn't worry about this, it's del del t on this side, nu del squared on this side. So nu is a diffusion coefficient. Yeah? So all right, and then some external force. External force could be gravity, or external force could be something uh, like the Coriolis force that you were seeing a few minutes ago. Or in this case of uh, uh, turbulence, maybe what uh, is, you have to keep in your back of the uh, in the back of your mind for the most part is stirring your sugar in the coffee. So you have a stirring force. That's the external force. That stirring actually makes the um, uh, coffee, uh, uh, liquid turbulent, and that's why the sugar mixes. The sugar would have mixed, even if you did nothing. You just sat, except your coffee would become cold, right? I mean, so uh, the whole purpose of stirring uh, the uh, coffee uh, is to be able to drink it hot and sweet, um, and uh, that requires a time scale. So the time scale uh, uh, has to be the uh, diffusion, natural diffusion coefficient has to be aided by um, uh, this turbulent process. So you in, uh, do the stirring, the external force which brings in the, um, uh, uh, or maintains the turbulence, and uh, you have this very efficient mix process which uh, gives you a uh, hot coffee uh, hot sweet coffee in a minute so huh? uh, sure I mean uh, equations are not initial condition dependent the solutions are yeah, sure. I mean, unless I tell you what V is as a function at the at t equal to zero, how would you It can lead to, so that is why the solution is complicated. But you can't solve it unless I give you an initial condition. Is that you will get a very different, that is why I'm talking about the fact that instead of talking about a definite velocity at the end of the day, that talk about a class of solutions, we'll be talking about a class of solutions in uh, this turbulent regime, which are more uh, classified by a problem. That is, I give you a set of init small in initial conditions. You get a wide variety of the velocity, wide variety of V. So you talk about a distribution of the velocities rather than the I mean, you can talk about them, but that's not going to be very meaningful to talk about a, la a small, over a small basin of initial conditions, you get this gigantic set of uh, final solutions, right? I mean, but every initial condition does lead to a final V of RT. And the only way you can solve it is given an initial condition. Yeah, so, <coughs> so all right, so this is it. So we have to do what uh, we um, uh, saw. So, uh, ah, 
first lab, though, this pressure term. If it's an incompressible fluid and I'm going to take advantage of it, I'm going to remove that term. So how does, what is an, an uh, what's the consequence of uh, uh, incompressible fluid? What's the as question is, what is the evolution equation for the density of a fluid? The density evolves according to the conservation law that del rho del t plus divergence rho v is equal to zero. Right? That's the conservation of ma mass conservation uh, for a liquid, um, uh, for any fluid. So this is conservation of mass. Right? I mean, the way you uh, uh, prove it, uh, uh, obtain it, is by considering a, a small volume and seeing how much fluid flows into it and how much flows out of it per unit time. What flows, the difference between what flows in and flows out is in uh, this uh, part over here. And if there is, if this is non-zero, and there has been an imbalance created, the density has to change, and that is so the explicit change in density uh, takes care of the um, uh, divergence that produces that imbalance. So it's the conservation. The uh, density can only change if there is a net divergence, and if the density is a constant in time, does not change, then the divergence has to be equal to zero. This is the same as uh, electric current, the um, uh, um, charge conservation law. So this is the mass conservation law for the fluid over here, and it's del rho del t plus divergence rho v uh, equal to zero. So you can very easily convince yourself by looking at the uh, mass balance of this. The, in, uh, uh, the next thing which you can do, at, given that that is a consequence of mass conservation over here, which is actually very easy to see. I mean, just how, many, how much fluid entering that's th 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 through this cylinder over here, which is of length, um, of the velocity perpendicular, and how much that you get, take the difference, all six sides gives the answer. So that's, the, uh, that's that. Now play the same game for momentum conservation. So, and you should get this equation over here. So this, you can check for yourself, is nothing other than momentum conservation. So, uh, mom momentum conservation, and uh, that's uh, uh, that chap uh, over there. Um, uh, you would, that is, if it is going to be conserved, the gradient of P is the internal. So this is like uh, the right hand side has come from uh, external forces. This part, if it was just, uh, would be equal to zero for an incompressible fluid if uh, there is going to be no uh, change of momentum. If there is going to be change of momentum, there has to be some cause which is force by Newton's law. There is external force, internal pressure differences between the liquid causing a flow over here and dissipative forces at work over here. So uh, consider momentum conservation, get this DVDT uh, expression out, which is this one over here, and that has to be equal to the external forces, which are those. All right, so uh, that's uh, just try it out to get the, or it's just the material derivative, but uh, you can get the expression even if it is a, a compressible um, uh, fluid, that is with this uh, generally holding true, you would still get that. Um, <clears throat> except that you would have to put a, a one over rho over here. It would be rho times that, and this saying that rho is a constant and just take it out of circulation would not be allowed. Um, but the, with rho equal to constant then, this is trivial. This simply means if rho is equal to constant, constant in space and time, this means that divergence V is equal to zero. So if it is an incompressible fluid, the condition on the, there is a constraint on the velocity field, which is that divergence V is equal to zero. Absolutely general constraint. So <clears throat> I'll, drop the external force term for the time being, or I'll make the assumption either you just set F external equal to zero, 
or if you are going to have a F external, I'm only going to have the friendly F externals whose divergence is equal to zero. So when I take a divergence of this equation over here, the the uh, this so-called Navier-Stokes equation, which I've written down, if I take the divergence of this equation, the first term, del V del T, divergence of that is zero. The second term, the divergence is divergence of V dot del on V is equal to minus del square P, and then the next term is zero, and the next term is zero. So P is fixed. So P is fixed by the velocity. The pressure gets slaved to the velocity field for the um, uh, <coughs> incompressible fluid. And you can simply formally write P is equal to minus 1 over the inverse uh, Laplacian operator del V dot grad. So pressure is actually can be taken out of the game. So if it's an incompressible fluid, I can formally take out, uh, you get the solution for uh, the velocity field, and you can get the pressure by, you put, the, uh, put this pressure in over here, solve for Navier-Stokes equation, and you get the pressure by putting this back in over here. So all right, so uh, uh, here is uh, pressure uh, is not something that we would have to worry about. It has, as expected, the dimension exactly the uh, dimension of this, um, uh, that is, grad P has exactly the dimension of V dot uh, grad, uh, grad V. P is 1 over uh, grad of V dot So. Uh, everything checks, that is, grad P has the same dimension as V dot grad P. So now comes the question of uh, uh, what are the scales that we are talking about over here. So this is the balance which you saw um, done a few minutes ago, that look, there is, I mean, if there is a characteristic velocity, so some V bar, is some characteristic flow speed. And L is some characteristic length scale. So it, if it is a flow, water flowing through a pipe. So if it is water flowing through a pipe, the rate at which water is coming out, I mean, which you can measure by just having a measure, a stopwatch and a measuring glass on the other side. So that tells you what the mean velocity of flow is. So you can easily, that mean velocity of flow, which you can measure by putting a setting a graduated tumbler and a stopwatch over here, that is your V bar. And what is L? L is the radius of the cylinder through which the water is flowing. So those are the characteristic length scales and characteristic flow speeds. So characteristic length scales and characteristic flow speeds, and I can now estimate uh, these two terms over here. So who are the <coughs> uh, term, uh, terms which I have to worry about? This and this, these two are the nonlinear terms. And the, so far as these dimensional pictures go, uh, this does not have an independent existence. It's just a club to uh, V dot del V. So these are the nonlinear terms, and this is the linear term. So <clears throat> here is the uh, linear term, and uh, so I have to estimate the nonlinear term. So the nonlinear term would be typically v, v bar square divided by L. The viscous drag would be V bar divided by L square 
times nu. So these are the two terms. So if I want to look at the evolution, del V del T, uh, evolution is going to be determined by either uh, this V square over L or this V, uh, depending on which dominates. So, so it's going to be determined by which dominates and the domination is going to be determined by a, a, a ratio. So that ratio so is what is called a Reynolds number, R <coughs> E. Uh, so it's this Reynolds number, Reynolds number for the flow and it is v bar uh, times L divided by nu. So Reynolds number for the flow, which is v bar greater than nu. So it's Reynolds number much, much greater than one. The nonlinear terms will completely swamp the uh, viscous drag. And as you can imagine, that that is what it is the uh, nonlinear cup, the, the nonlinearity of these, or in the case of the ordinary differential equations, which gets rise to the sensitivity, it is the nonlinearity over here which gives rise to um, uh, this uh, uh, the complicated, the so called all seemingly random function of space and time. And so the turbulent regime that one would talk about is. Uh, regime where the Reynolds number is extremely high. So you start with, in this particular kind of problem, which are governed simply by uh, Navier-Stokes equation with uh, no uh, significant f external, uh, except, I mean, once again, back to the stirring the coffee, the f external is some stirring force of uh, con uh, reasonably constant magnitude, which you have uh, supplied at large length scales, doesn't really um, uh, bother you too much, uh, except to do what we'll see in a minute. Uh, it is, uh, if there were gravity or rotation that we um, uh, talked about, that, that you saw uh, talked about a few minutes ago, uh, there would be other numbers which would be coming into the consideration. But for now, if it is going to be a very complicated motion, which would have to be dominated by the nonlinear terms, it would have to be a condition, Reynolds number much greater than one. So if you were um, uh, to be talking about fluids which are like honey and so on, it would be very unlikely that uh, you could make honey turbulent by stirring. But you can, that again opens up a different can of worms actually, those very viscous fluids, they have their own dynamics which are quite complicated. But anyway, it's large Reynolds number. So conclusion is that we want the large Reynolds number flow uh, which, where we have to set our sights. So, our issue is with these large uh, Reynolds number flows. So, all right, large Reynolds number, and now uh, what? All right, uh, what I have just told you has said that uh, writing down V as a function of R and T is a useless business. That's what I basically told you, that we are looking for solutions, these turbulent solutions, which are seemingly random functions of space and time. So uh, it's a waste trying to write uh, uh, what the solution is. But what about the energy? So we'll focus on what about the total energy of this system, or how does the energy behave? So we are going to start talking about the energy, the kinetic energy in this case, which is K, which is half, uh, where one talks about kinetic energy per unit mass, so uh, in this game, so it is half V square R T integrated over uh, all space, and then you divide by the total volume. So you talk about uh, 
total kinetic energy, total kinetic energy of uh, uh, ki total kinetic energy per uh, unit mass, uh, uh, so uh, uh, divided by divided out by the volume. So it is still uh, the kinetic energy per unit mass, which is sort of averaged out over the entire volume, and therefore this is this defines uh, average value. It is half of average v squared. So you have taken v at every point in space, integrated over um, the uh, 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 whole space, divided by out by the volume. So in effect, what you are talking about is v squared average. It is also a kind of average of realizations. If V is going to be a random function of uh, space and time, then this average V square, which you calculate in this fashion over here, would also be the average V square over the probability distribution that you would have for V. So that's a kind of ergodicity um, uh, in this uh, business. So. Uh, this is an average value uh, just by construction, and this average half v square. So that is what one is interested in. I am interested in calculating del k del t, which is, so I'm uh, uh, by this condition over here, that goes out goes the 2 v dot we uh, this d three r. So this is equal to one over v v dot, and now I'm going to substitute for the v dot that I have, which is minus gradient. So this dotted with minus gradient of p minus v dot grad v uh, plus eta del square v plus, so this is integral d3r, plus 1 over v d3r f external dotted with v. Right, so we have um, uh, three uh, uh, terms over here. Now, and it's an incompressible flow. So it is V dot grad P D3R. V dot grad P D3R is divergence of P times the velocity D3R minus, integra minus P divergence of V d3r, just use the vector identity that v dot grad p is divergence of pv minus p uh, divergence of v, incompressible fluid, so this goes to zero, and then I have a divergence where, where integrated over a volume, so I have Gauss, and uh, to tell me that this is pv dot ds. So over the bounding surface. Now what kind of a bounding surface? Bounding surface either may be very far away, maybe you are talking about an infinite, in which case the velocities will fall, fall off at infinity and you would have zero. Or if it is this glass in which I'm stirring the fluid, you, have, you are looking at finite boundaries. Boundaries are static. Therefore, if it's a viscous fluid, the fluid has to be static at the boundary. So static boundaries with viscous fluid means that on the surface, V has to be equal to zero. If you are infinitely far away and the velocity for any reasonable solution has to fall away at large distances, so this is zero nonetheless. So this is equal to zero. Pardon? Uh, del? Yeah. No, de K is defined. K is defined over here. That's your K. Yeah. 
This is the volume, the total volume over which I'm integrating. This k is integrated, is integrating v square at every point over here over the volume v, and after I have done the integral, I'm dividing out by the total v. So what's your question? Yeah. X, y, z. You have integrated something over x, y, z and still have... Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, I could have written dk dt actually. So, huh. So, this is zero. All right. Oh, this is easy to demonstrate. The next one is also going to be zero. That takes two more lines than this, and therefore it's for you to do. Right? <clears throat> the, for this uh, over here, it is V. Uh, it is V alpha, V beta, del beta, V alpha integrated over uh, D3R. And you, you simply note first that this can be written as del, del beta of V alpha, V alpha. And then uh, you can play the same game as I played over here. So, uh, so this is going to be, so this is gone. This is zero. This is zero. So one is, uh, so the nonlinear terms don't play a role. So in this global energy balance that we are talking about, this del k del t, the two nonlinear chaps that I had have integrated out to zero. That's a tremendous help, right? I mean, so uh, looking at this energy is a, a, a big help. So. So all right, so we are uh, done, uh, that, that's done. So what remains? Remains this term over here. So this del k del t is equal to, now it is one over v times nu, and you do this by parts. There, uh, you do this by parts, and it becomes with a minus sign, del alpha v beta whole square d3r. You were looking at uh, and, and del square um, uh, v alpha dot del square v alpha, which is del beta del beta, do our integration by parts, and uh, the <coughs> integrated part will go away um, uh, for the same reason that we talked about before. And what remains is going to be this. So it's that, and it is plus 1 over V F external So, as expected, this one, this is positive definite. There is a negative sign coming from the fact that I have done an integration by parts to shift a grad from here. There were two grads. I've shifted one to from here to over here. So that is what has brought up that. Uh, and so it is uh, equal to minus new expectation value of del alpha v beta square plus this is the rate at which I'm in, so what is this physically? The rate at which forcing, external forcing is injecting energy. And this is the rate at which you are dissipating energy. That is what the role of viscosity is. Viscosity dissipates energy, and the uh, 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 external force is uh, pumping in energy, and you are pumping in energy at a rate, uh, let's say, a constant rate, epsilon. So your rate of energy input Yeah. So uh, there we are. So we have a very uh, nice equation for the change of the total kinetic energy. 
which is minus nu del and, and a, a viscous term which dissipates uh, external forcing. So it is the stirring in this, uh, which is your external force that is pumping energy into the system and uh, you are uh, dissipating as um, uh, because it's viscosity. All right, now look at something. Where are these things important? Obviously, this is the injection which is taking place at high, uh, at large length scales. So this is operative at large length scales. This operates at large scales. What about this? This has a derivative in it. It is a de derivative squared. So del alpha well, uh, um, v beta square. So it is this is going to be big only at small scales. So this is going to work at small scales. After all, the viscosity is a molecular concept, and uh, the uh, viscous um, effects happen at very small scales. And so you expect that this dissipation is going to happen at uh, small scales. And there is this uh, obvious fact that your pumping is happening at large scales. So let's look at these scales. Yes, go ahead. I'm going to find that. I mean, so you have taken a glass of fluid and you are stirring it. So what's the scale for energy input? It's the size of the uh, uh, radius of the glass. Yeah, so that's the large scale. And uh, where does viscosity act? Can act only at very small scales. It's a molecular effect. So, And obviously that's helped by the fact that you have a gradient over here. So gradient means small length scales are where the gradient can be big. Yeah, small length scales, gradient is big. Viscosity is a small quantity. Uh, so therefore, yeah. So we need to find the scales. All right, so uh, L dissipation, the small viscous scale. L, the macroscopic input scale. Now what? Now uh, the uh, uh, what, how would you estimate L? So L would be estimated as uh, essentially uh, it is the rate at which you are pumping in energy. So. Uh, rate would be some average velocity square divided by some time. And how do you estimate this time? The time can be, an, uh, est no. the rate at which epsilon, the rate at which you are pumping in energy is v, uh, the average velocity square by some time scale. And what's it, uh, this time scale? The time scale uh, T is going to be like V L, the macroscopic length scale divided by V bar. So this is equal to V bar cubed over L. So that's, uh, and uh, that's how you get this uh, uh, capital L over here. So the typical macroscopic scale is V bar cubed over an, uh, epsilon. So epsilon, in terms of the uh, uh, rate at which you are injecting energy, it's this. Now what about the small scales? The small scale, what determines it? It's determined by... Once again, it is the same number. This is what is being uh, dissipated. So you have to dissipate an amount of energy epsilon. The dissipation is being done uh, by nu. So epsilon is, so this is now going to be dimensional analysis. Epsilon has the dimension of L square uh, uh, divided uh, uh, by uh, uh, this, uh, uh, it's L square and, uh, uh, by uh, T square, it's your L square uh, over uh, T cubed uh, uh, over here, and there is nu, which is L square 
it's a diffusion, so it's L squared uh, by T. And so here we are. So uh, it is a question of getting a length scale by removing the time scale. So you do new cubed and you divide by epsilon. And what you are going to get is LD to the power 4. So you have a LD, which is equal to nu cubed over epsilon to the power one quarter. So you have a small scale formed out of the dimensionless, uh, dimensional analysis, because two quantities which can determine it, the amount of energy which is going to be determined, uh, which is going to be dissipated, the viscosity which is going to dissipate it. So you do a dimensional analysis, and you find that the relevant length scale is this. Uh, the, uh, this picture of macroscopic motion, some average velocity that divided by um, uh, T, that's the rate of energy input, and T is like characteristic, once again, dimensional analysis, it's L over V. And now it, it is, uh, once again, the, this is a little bit of exercise left for you to do that L over LD goes as Reynolds number to the power three quarter, where Reynolds number is V bar L over nu. So you just take the ratio of these two length scales and uh, you uh, play around a little bit, and it is going to be uh, Reynolds number. So Reynolds number makes an appearance. So Reynolds number makes an appearance in the ratio of these two scales, and we are interested in a regime where the Reynolds number is tremendously high. So turbulence occurs for very high Reynolds number. Turbulence means that these two ratios are, these two length scales are tremendously uh, well separated. And what are the length scales? The length scales are one at which the energy is being injected, the other at which the energy is being dissipated. Now comes the, so, now comes the big issue. All right, so, huh. Here is a balance. Now imagine that it is possible for me to talk about stationary so I want to talk about stationary turbulence. That is, it's a maintained turbulence where the turbulence turbulent state remains there forever. It's not an equilibrium state, but it's a stationary state where the energy is balanced overall. So there is no growth of the average, this uh, macroscopically averaged energy, kinetic energy. That's going to remain stationary. You are not going to be have, you are not going to have the system uh, sort of uh, stop moving, in which would happen if this delta delta is negative, or become uh, in, uh, the velocity become tremendously big, which would happen if delta delta is positive. If you have a stationary state, then delta delta is equal to zero. Stationary turbulence requires that epsilon is nu, and then del alpha. So average value of this, right? So this is the condition for stationary turbulence. And now you have a problem, or the in thing which makes uh, turbulence interesting. Epsilon is a constant which does not know about viscosity. Yeah. So I'm merely stirring in energy at these large length scales, and, and that is at this rate epsilon over here. I'm dissipating the viscosity, it's stationary turbulence, the viscosity is dissipating it at large. And this would happen, I can now change my new and 
this is independent of uh, what uh, this uh, uh, epsilon is. And I can take the limit of nu going to 0. And I would still have a finite uh, number for this. And uh, if I take limit nu tending to 0, then in that limit, del alpha v beta square has to blow up. So if, because this viscous dissipation rate is independent of the viscosity, it is just a number which I can I have just given it as a number in the problem. And for maintaining stationarity, you have to have that. And therefore, this gradient of the velocity has to blow up. That average has to blow up as nu tends to 0. And this is what is called the viscosity anomaly. So and the whole business of turbulence is a big a central problem is this viscosity anomaly that this average uh, square has to blow up blows up where now you see what, uh, where did it blow up? In the limit of new tending to zero. So that is for Reynolds number tending to infinity. So if Reynolds number tends to infinity in that limit, the turbulence uh, turbulent velocity field has such a structure that this del alpha v beta square has to blow up. But what is del alpha? So that's operative at uh, uh, very uh, small scales. So this is operative. So what is del alpha v beta? So it is like v at a point x plus r minus v x and, uh, and minus v x divided by r. That is what is a measure of. That is what is a measure of this del alpha, del beta. And so this has to blow up. This has to blow up means that this difference over here has to be smaller than r. That is, it has to be, for this to blow up, this difference over here has to be r to the power some alpha, uh, let's say alpha, with alpha less than 1. So if it is r to the power alpha with alpha less than 1, it's only then this has a divergence as r goes to 0. And r, small r is where the uh, things, this dissipation is effective. So you have a very strange velocity. The derivative is no longer a well-defined quantity. You have a strange kind of velocity field at very small scales. So at small scales, you have a big problem. And the characterization, therefore, would be that you want to seek a characterization. A central issue would be the question of characterization of this quantity over here. So that's the logic of why you, whenever you see people talking about turbulence, they don't so much as, uh, or at least talk about a particular part of uh, uh, turbulence, not so much as talking about velocities, but about these velocity differences that this Vx plus R minus V of X uh, for small r. That's the problem. And what we started out with saying is that the, uh, uh, it, the whole business is to talk about not a given va uh, value of V of an, uh, R and T, but a probability distribution. Therefore, the point would be that what one would be interested, this is your this is a quantity that you want to talk about. And you are interested in the, so this is your delta v. I'm dropping subscripts for now. I'll come back in a minute and write subscripts. Uh, 
So delta V, which is defined as this, and you are, you are interested in the probability distribution of delta V, the first point of which would be, if you are interested in that, the ultimate goal would be that find this extremely difficult, then can we find can we find this? And that is the thing which Kolmogorov wrote down. So this is what Kolmogorov wrote down in 1941 through a logic which I'll take uh, just two or three minutes to complete. So. Kolmogorov, so you have this question of this, what do these powers, how, how do these powers of the velocity field, how do these average values behave? I have a, a probability distribution, that is the holy grail. Find this, extremely difficult. Can I find this? And uh, to, so come back to the picture that we had about these various scales and so on. And the whole business was that here is the input. These nonlinear terms have disappeared from your uh, framework. And in this energy in budget of the problem, this is my, let's say, uh, distance scale. And if one talks about uh, momentum, so if one talks about uh, uh, the uh, wave vector space, which is the other, which is very practical actually, and k is like one over l, so wave vector is the Fourier space. So you talk about u x t, v x t, which we have talked about, or I could have talked about the thing in the Fourier space. So. Uh, they are sort of uh, invert, uh, inversely related, distance scales and Fourier uh, wave vector scales are. Uh, so here is this small the, uh, uh, distance scale which is decreasing. This is decreasing distance scale over here. Here somewhere is LD and you have viscous dissipation. Here somewhere is capital L and you have injection. In between, there is this huge range, which for large Reynolds number is getting extremely big. So these scales are very well separated. And here in between lies a set of scales which are far from the input and far from the dissipation. And this is what this set of scales is what Kolmogorov called the inertial range. And uh, the, in this inertial range, you neither see this end nor see that end. So what kind of a liquid you are, consider, fluid you are considering is unimportant. Whether its viscosity is big or small or what exactly its value is, this is not your bother when you are sitting over here. Neither is it your consideration of how did energy come in over here. So this inertial range is universal. It does not universal, it does not depend on what the fluid is, it does not depend on how it is being stirred or how it is being maintained. And therefore, whatever result you uh, write down over here is good. So now, who is maintaining the inertial range? This is where those nonlinear terms which we did not, well, which we dropped out of consideration, this v dot, v dot grad dotted with v d3r, and not in this, when we integrated it out, it didn't work. But the individ, ind, integrated effect is nothing. But what this does is it transfers energy from one scale to another. So it is this, the role of these nonlinear terms are to transfer energy from one scale to another. 
And in this inertia, so you input energy over here at large scales, then the nonlinear terms come into play, gradually takes it down for, from one wave number to another wave number, uh, so on, or one length scale, and it, uh, delivers it over here where it is uh, dissipated. So in between, in this range over here, as Kolmogorov, that things can only depend upon epsilon, which is the rate at which this energy is flowing continuously through this space of length scales. So any quantity that I look at, epsilon, and what is the quantity that we have on that delta V, it is R. Delta V has to depend upon R. So it depends upon R and upon the only other quantity that you see in this point, at this point over here, which is this epsilon. So Kolmogorov, uh, 1941 essentially says that delta Vn average will be determined by determined by epsilon and R. And now you, it's a dimensional analysis. Epsilon has the dimension L squared over T cubed. R has the dimension L. This has the dimension L over T to the power N. So just do it and it would be some Cn epsilon to the power n by 3, r to the power n by 3. That is Kolmogorov. So delta v uh, to the power n, uh, so whatever this distribution of delta v is, its moment, says Kolmogorov, would be characterized by this. So we'll end with just two points over here. One uh, the, to note is that if epsilon goes to zero, if, if nu goes to zero, the Reynolds number infinity limit, Reynolds number going to infinity, that is nu tending to zero, there is only one length scale in the problem, which is L. The, this has gone to zero essentially, and you have only uh, capital L as the surviving uh, length scale in the limit of nu going to zero. And so uh, if that is a surviving length scale, dimensional analysis should actually tell you that this is this equal to r to the power epsilon to the power n over three, and, uh, r to the power n, some function of R over L. So that should be the real answer. I mean, there is this length scale capital L in the limit of Reynolds number going to infinity. I still have this capital L as the length scale in the problem, and there could be a function of R over L. If in the li in limit of R going to zero, so F zero, if it exists, then this is correct. But suppose you calculate, or you have some reason to believe that F0 blows up. So if F0 blows up, then you don't have Kolmogorov. And if the picture, this question of F0 blowing up, is what in turbulence is known as the phenomenon of intermittency. So, so long as F0, the Kolmogorov assumption is that an F of zero exists, and you have this picture over here, but if r equal to zero, as things go to r equal to zero, uh, taking the limit becomes a problematic business. If I go, am in the business of calculating f of r over l uh, and find that it blows up at r equal to zero, I'm going to have a deviation, and that's the phenomenon of intermittency. So that essentially uh, does the job for me for introducing the buzzwords. All the buzzwords are there, uh, the Reynolds number, uh, dissipative anomaly, uh, uh, the energy uh, balance, and uh, uh, Kolmogorov uh, uh, answer, and the breakdown possibility of Kolmogorov answer. So we have all the buzzwords in there. Uh, 
the manipulations are still now not, not very difficult. But uh, so uh, uh, you can, I mean, uh, seek clarification now on anything, or uh, we can, I mean, there is all afternoon and uh, uh, to um, uh, talk about whatever is problematic. So um, we can, I mean, whatever, I mean, so I'm willing, wh whichever point is uh, uh, a, a difficulty for you, uh, if there is something right now on the board which you want clarified, let's get it done. Otherwise, I mean, there is all afternoon to talk about. Yeah, go ahead. Huh. We're in? If F0 blows up. If F0 blows up, there can be universality. There can still, I mean, there can, the function, all right. Suppose F of R over L behaves as L over R to some power X for R going to zero. And X is a universal number. Then you still have universality. I mean, F blows up. So a blowing up of F at R going to zero would be characterized by some uh, power law L over R to the power X. Yeah? So if X is a universal number, if X is a number which does not depend on how you inj which it would not. If you could be able to, if you were in a position to calculate uh, uh, this F, you would find that, uh, all right, I mean, it's not that one can calculate F, but suppose you could, you would find that this is a number which has no reason to depend in this infinite Reynolds number limit on the kind of fluid you have, because it's zero viscosity limit, or the length scale at which you are uh, injecting. I mean, actual experimental observation does favor a small value of x. Smaller and smaller scales. That's where everything is happening, right? So you go to smaller and smaller scales. You try to calculate this function over here. So long as it gives you as argo, so long as it's a nice analytic function going to a constant value, you don't have a problem. Should it be ill-behaved and having a divergent behavior as uh, r goes to zero? That's yeah. They are the only place. Yeah. Then it's, then it's not universal. But why should it not be universal? The nonlinear terms don't have, uh, don't have any, uh, the coefficient of the nonlinear terms is fixed by Galilean invariance to be one. Yeah? I mean, it's, you don't have any coupling constant over there which uh, uh, could have changed things if uh, so on and so forth. Yeah? And you have set, I mean, the new has been removed from the problem by going to the limit of Reynolds number going to infinity. L has been taken into account by saying that it is this ratio. So now you have no other option but to just get a number. Yeah. Huh. Inertia, no, 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 it's not in the inertial range. It is a range which is <coughs> of the order of this dissipative scale LD over here. So you are talking about the R, which is somewhere, I mean, beyond this, but all right, I mean, it is, see, the whole business of if it is LD going to zero, which is the infinite Reynolds number, then uh, the R is essentially all the range over here. Right. If LD is pushed down to zero, which is the infinite Reynolds number, then you have R as the whole playground from here to up to some point, so long as you are not uh, encroaching that. Should you be looking at a finite Reynolds number with a LD over here, then you are looking at L much greater than R. So R that you are looking at is, is an, uh, some, if it is inertial range, there is this question of R lying between ca somewhere much smaller than capital L, greater than LD, the dissipation length scale. And so that technically defines the in, uh, inertial range, and that 
technically also makes the problem. That is why this is an uh, extremely uh, 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 problematic situation. Uh, because if one had a single length scale, if I had a bound on one direction only, then uh, it should have been somewhat easier. That is, all critical phenomena problem, phase transition problems are solved in the limit when this is infinity and this is a finite thing and you are interested in the limit of R much greater than uh, uh, the dissipation length, but nothing to uh, uh, block your view over here. Here, the point is that in a corresponding um, uh, situation, the corresponding situation with one length scale is that if you are able to push this to zero, which is the infinite Reynolds number, then it is R is anywhere over here, so long as you are not encroaching upon this over here. But it's a small r problem rather than the large r of the phase transitions, and small r technically has a lot of difficulty, and that is the difficulty which shows up if you try, try to uh, compute um, uh, this quantity over here. If it's, on the other hand, a finite Reynolds number, then, re the, then the point is where is r? This is entirely where the dissipation is dominating, so you don't want to put R in that region. You, it is R which is somewhat away from this uh, LD, greater than LD over here, but uh, 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 not encroaching upon this endpoint. So R lies in the inertial range is sort of a device which one gets in order to keep both of these to be safe from both sides over here. But if you know that there is danger on both sides, that it is extremely difficult to come up with a consistent theory. So that's the uh, question. I mean, the, uh, the uh, uh, dimensional argument worked, uh, gives you an answer. But can I actually, uh, 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 for, uh, as in either quantum field theory or in uh, critical phenomena, uh, do the kind of analysis that people de there do and get scaling exponents out, that does not work because of the uh, two length scales over here. And uh, it, uh, it could have worked if you um, uh, were uh, to take the large, where you would worry about only one length scale, but that brings up a whole set of other technical difficulties which seem to be very problematic. So, um, anyway, I mean, that, that, that's the answer. It is a finite Reynolds number. R is in the inertial range, but inertial range means that you are you have, you're looking at bounds on both sides. Fine, fine with me. Where? 